Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, that we may be recreated, and you shall renew the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom we honor this day, the day in which she was born, to grace the whole universe as the masterpiece of God, the Immaculate Conception, the new Eve in the new order of grace, to accompany in the work of redemption the new Adam, and to dispose all of us, the mystical body of Christ, for the outpouring of the gift of the same spirit that you espoused, Mary espoused, through the fiat of the little daughter, Louisa Picaretta. We ask that you, Mary, on this day of yours, exfuse singular gifts to us who desire to live in God's will with our will and intellect and memory, offering you, consecrating to you, our holy heartbeat, lifeblood, and breath, so that from this day forth, the divine will may be our soul, heart's desire, and we pledge it to you this day to live always for the divine will in all things henceforth. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's say a little prayer in honor of Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I'm going to grab your little statue of Our Lady that I have beside me. And this is a statue of the place where I received my vocation in 1998. I was standing before this statue when I gave my fiat to God to embark upon the seminary, having no idea what it was all about. <laughs> but I gave my fiat to God through Mary, and this is a statue. Our Queen, a Lady of Peace, Lady of Medjugorje. Mia, <laughs> peace. So, we love you, Mary. They say in Italian, ti vogliamo bene. <laughs> okay, so let's begin if you have any questions with uh, anything concerning, first and foremost, the divine will naturally, and its relation to the church, our own spirituality, the doctrines contained in Louise's writings, or even her autobiography, her life. Oh, one thing I also, also wanted to share with you today, and I say it's also an, a convenient day. Today, volume one is officially going out to hit the press <laughs> because I had sent it out to several people to have it proofread, and it came back today, and I proofread it myself. You know, it's hard to proofread your own writing because you get sort of like word blind, you, especially you, you're used to your own grammar, so you skip over words that anyone else would pick up. Nonetheless, that's one convenient or fortuitous event that happened on the day of the birth of our Blessed Mother. What else happened on the day of our Blessed Mother? Louisa received the gift of living in the divine world. She said it was the eve, September 7th, of the Feast of Our Lady of purity, but the, the, the next day is the birthday of Our Lady. Now, um, Louisa received the gift over a period of days. It began on the eve when Jesus wed her in heaven. And then a few days later, she doesn't give the date. She says a few days later, then the Trinity transformed my inside, so to speak, where I felt like I was divinized. That's the word she uses. So between September 8th and the 14th, which is the triumph of the cross, this, the, this the divine will was given to her as a gift. Before it was given on loan, that's still a gift. This is something I want to clarify because some people tend to make a distinction between experiencing living in the divine will before uh, that is on loan and after that is after permanent, permanently entering therein. But they're both gifts. It's not as if on loan is not a gift. It is a gift. Because what does on loan mean? You are participating in that one eternal operation of God, however intermittently, but that one eternal operation is a gift. 
no saint could acquire or achieve it through virtue or human sanctity. So it's all a gift, whether it's on loan or whether it's permanently given. So thank you. So let us begin, Dr. Michael, will you know who, who's asking first, whatever question there is? Father, we have a question from Brunella who just visited Corrado in Rome. And she says that she tried to see the statue of St. Hannibal di Francia at St. Peter's, but someone told her it's not accessible to the public. You being an Italian, could you let us know when it would be accessible to the public? Yeah, yeah when she received Italian citizenship. <laughs> I'll be right back, one second. Well, that was a bad joke. <laughs> no, the Italians are not like that. Um, the reason it's not accessible is it's be behind the Swiss Guards. So if you're looking at the facade of the Vatican, right, you have the right side of the facade where the chimney is where a new pope selected. The black and the smoke come out on the right side. On the left side, you have a clock and bells that ring. Underneath that, you have the Swiss guards guarding entrance to the, in, the people that work at the Vatican offices. That's the entrance. Right behind the entrance is the statue of Hannibal to the right. People were allowed in there on the day of his inauguration, that is, the inauguration of his statue. <clears throat> but you would require permission. Why? Because there are good and bad people in the world. We all know that. And sometimes people with bad motives will get in to do whatever they do. Remember when Pope John Paul II spoke out publicly against the evils of those individuals who blew up the vehicle of Falcone and Borsellini. There were two police officers just getting in the inside circle of the mafia, about to crack it, and they were both killed from an inside source of the police office. So Pope John Paul II took to the microphone and said, God will judge you. Il Signore ti giudicare. That's how he spoke, right? And the next day, somebody got into the Vatican and blew up St. John Lateran. They put a bomb, literally, inside the right side of St. John Lateran entrance. Ever since that event, you have to now go through controls, elected controls, to go through any basilica one. Before this event, you didn't have to do that. It takes one bad apple to inconvenience the whole world. So to get into the Vatican, now you have to basically be vetted, just not to ensure that you're legit, you're, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, you can find photos of it. You can get in if you're ever in Italy. Um, you can go to, on the right side of the Colonnade of Bernini, that surrounds St. Peter's Square, St. Peter's Basilica Square. You have the Swiss guards on that side as well. You have to go up the stairs and you'll see the guards. And you have to ask them permission to see, to acquire tickets for the general audience on Wednesday. And while you're there, you can there inquire, how can I view the statue of St. Hannah? Well, that's one way. Another way is to ask a priest or someone who works at the Vatican or someone who has access there too, to see it in, and they'll, they'll arrange it for you. Thank you. Patricia, go ahead. Father, thank you for what you shared in the road radio program yesterday. You put a nugget there, like a carrot. Can you speak more about the 33 new graces that you found from this, <laughs> from Luisa's writings? <laughs> yes, yes, they are interspersed throughout the dissertation. I did not make a methodological effort to identify and enumerate them one by one. I can one day when I have the time, but... There are many new graces. And to give you just a few, I'll pull up the dissertation. Um, and then show you the pages where it's just a few of them. Okay, Jesus refers to what's called a unifying virtue. That's a new grace. Okay, this is found. Uh, several volumes. One is volume 25, Christmas Day, 1928. In the dissertation, it's mentioned on page 54. It's also mentioned on page 96, on page 148, on page 428. Now, let me just quote this one new grace, unifying virtue that's not been experienced by any saint before. And of course, that the generate, generating virtue, I'll go into that next. 
um, on page 428 of the dissertation, you'll find a quote from Louise's writings from volume 26, July 30th, 1929, where he tells her, what a difference there is between those operate by the virtues in a saintly way, that is the saints of the past, and those who operate by the virtues in the divine order of my divine law. These are known as divine virtues, which I talked about this past Saturday on Radio Maria. As the former, that is the Christian virtues or moral virtues, practice the virtues, their virtues remain separated from each other. They remain separated from each other, such that the diversity of their acts appears. One virtuous act appears of patience, another of obedience, another of charity, and so forth, all distinct and separate. They're incapable of fusing themselves together to form one single act that would otherwise lend itself to the divine will and embrace eternity and infinity. They can't go past time and space, and they cannot even use themselves in the present. However, by operating in my divine will, these souls acquire its light that has the communicating and unifying virtue, which makes them capable of accomplishing all of their virtues within the source of this light and of fusing the virtues together to form one single act with innumerable effects that embrace the creator, that's eternity, himself within the infinite infinity of his light. Our unifying strength, meaning the Trinity's unifying strength, possesses the communicating virtue. That's another grace. Unifying virtue, communicating virtue. In such a way that all creatures do so desire. Who do, who do so desire may partake of the blessings these souls place at everyone's disposal. Oh, if everyone knew the great secret of operating in my divine law, they would compete so as not to let any act that proceeds from within its most pure light escape it. Then, of course, I mentioned too right there, there's another one called the generating virtue. And they're not all virtues. Of the virtues, about seven are new graces, but then there are other new graces that are not virtues. The generating virtue was also found in Louisa's volume 31, August 14, 1932. And here Jesus tells her, our adorable Trinity divinity tends by its very nature and in an irresistible way to generate continuously without interruption. The first generating act we do is within ourselves, ad intra operatio, the internal operation of the Trinity. The Father continuously generates me, the Son, and I am continuously generating, generated by him. The Heavenly Father generates me and loves me. I am generated and I love him. And from both of us, love, the Holy Spirit, proceeds. All that which eternity encompasses in one single generating act forms the entire union of our divine being. Therefore, this reciprocal love of ours forms the third person of our supreme being, the fiat, the fiat of sanctification, the Holy Spirit, who is inseparable from us and who it seems is not content with our generating act within us, but wants to generate outside of us, within souls. This is ex opere, oh, sorry, ad extra operatio. So the Father and the Son generate this generating virtue ad inter operatio and the Spirit ad extra operatio. That's what he's alluding to here. Outside of us, within souls. And here is the task we entrust our, to our will, animated by our love, which is the Holy Spirit, to descend into souls and form with its light our divine generation. But it can do this only in the soul who lives in our will, as outside of it there is no place where it can form our divine life. Our word would not find a listening ear to hear us, and bereft of our knowledge, love would not find the substance it needs in order to generate. Hence the reason for the complete disorder of most Holy Trinity in the human creature. Only our will is able to form this divine generation of ours. So without the unifying virtue that makes all the virtues fuse together and the communicating virtue that enables this 
every virtuous act of the soul living in the divine will to impact all creatures of all time and even God himself. This generating virtue has no purpose. This generating virtue enables God's one eternal operation from the uncreated source of light itself, which is God uncreated light, whence the sun proceeds as light from light, true God from true God, um, to communicate to us this generating virtue from within the Father and the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit is communicated to us whereby we receive the unifying and communicating virtue. So the generating virtue is the first one we get. Without that, we're in complete disorder. Everything is separated. Everything is independent, independently working. And the, that's just three of the 33. Thank you. Father, we have a question from the chat that says, uh, what is your opinion on Our Lady of Medjugorje who said that her true birthday was August 5th, considering the church celebrates her birthday today? Well, my opinion matters little. So what I'll tell you is what the seers of Medjugorje said, because they were the first testimonies of that message. And they said that when they asked her, which do you prefer? to celebrate your birthday on this day or on August 5th? She said, I prefer both. <laughs> no. So that doesn't mean that we have to choose one or the other. Our Lady gets blessed twice and she deserves it. She has two birthdays, thanks to the church. Same with the birthday of our Lord. It might not have happened exactly on December 25th, but it was definitely within that week or so. Even Anne Catherine Emmerich, who was given a vision of when it happened, said it's, if not Christmas, very close to it. So suppose Christmas is the 23rd or the 27th, Jesus is blessed twice than if the church celebrates it on a different day. And in reality, it's not the same day. But what matters is this, the event celebrated. Consider, for example, the synoptics, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Were these really Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We, in very high probability, we can affirm that it was definitely Matthew, the apostle. It was definitely John, the apostle. That's, that's provable. Mark was not an apostle. And um, Luke, he was, an, he was not, he was not, a, he was in a company of, he accompanied St. Paul in the journey, not an apostle. But can you prove that these were written by whoever Mark this was. No one can definitively say, was this the John Mark in the gospel that ran away when the, San, when the Sanhedrin sent out the soldiers to arrest the Jesus? And then they said, one man ran and the guardians, the guards grabbed his clothes and he took off naked, that was John Mark. And then there's a John Mark that accompanied Paul in his, in his um, travels for a while. Which of the Marks is this? We don't know. What matters is not so much who wrote it, but that it was inspired, every word of it inspired by God. That's what matters. Same thing with the letters that we find in the New Testament as well, of Jude and so forth. So as long as the event is real, that's what matters. And the Blessed Mother expressed as much by saying, I would like, I, I enjoy them celebrating my birthday on both days. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the round, is it okay to pray with the round in the kingdom of the divine will? Praying with the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, in ordinary time. Yeah, you should do it every time. Ordinary time, Lent, Advent, Easter, you name it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That was a nice question. Michelle. Hi, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Um, I'm listening to everyone today and... Um, you know, I'm also listening to a lot of um, the answer, oh, well, your answers, Father. Um, my question in particular would be for my father who passed away in April. I'm my father was, I'm yes, sorry. You, 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 I know I'm aware of that because you did inform me. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your prayers for him. Um, he was very simple in his faith, okay? And he loved, um, in particular, he had a great devotion um, to the passion of Jesus. And one of his favorite um, books was the hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And toward the end of his life in particular, um, when he was in stage with Parkinson's disease, um, he found a lot of comfort reading the book, even though he didn't fully understand, um, you know, a lot of the interaction, but he was so very taken with Louisa following Jesus and praying, um, you know, the like with his passion. And in particular, um, I actually found he had a prayer card, the last words of Louisa Picaretta, her spiritual testimony. And this also gave, gave him some consolation, um, especially in the last paragraph when she talked about, it's my road, it's the road that I've prepared for you. It's the road that I will keep reserved for all the souls who will ever want to live in the divine will. So my- oh, How nice is that? It is, Father, it's very beautiful. But my question for you is, so my father didn't really understand all this with the divine will, but he desired it. And you speak so much about desire, Father. I'd like to think in his simplicity and in the love that he had for Jesus and Mary, and um, in particular, um, you know, for servant of God, Louisa uh, Picaretta, um, and how she followed him in the hours of the passion and how he also tried to do that also. I'd like to think at the hour of his death that she would have interceded for him and that he would be have benefited from, from this. Well, I believe, even though Louisa doesn't explicitly state this, Father de Pio did, that every soul that desires to live in his will, she waits for when they die. Padre Pio said, I will wait at the gates of heaven for all of my spiritual children till the last one enters. I think Louisa, his compatriot, um, was of no different at disposition. She alludes to as much in her writings, in her letters, in particular correspondence. She talks about how Everyone who seeks to live in God's will and desires it, she is connected to. And Jesus assured her of that by calling her the third link to the gift. He said, everyone who receives the gift has to receive it through three links. Calls them three steps in a different area. And one is, the first one is Christ, who preceded him in eternity, Mary, who preceded him in time. And the third is Louisa. So it's Jesus, Mary, and Louisa. This triple link is essential for everyone, even if they don't know Louisa, to receive this gift. Just like salvation is essential through Jesus Christ, even though not everyone will know him before they die. Okay, thank you. Hi, Father. Does divine virtue operate in the soul of a person who's living imperfectly, like on loan? And the other part yes. of the question, question is, when you're living in the will on loan, is it only a deliberate conscious act that removes you from the will? Or is deliberate it... Deliberate sin. Deliberate sin. Deliberate venial sin. A venial sin will do it? Deliberate. Well, only grave sin removes us from the influx of God's one eternal operation. So a soul that is imperfect in the virtues, that's going in and out of the virtues, in and out of, let's say, um, conformity with the will of God, but is not committing a grave sin, remains in that one eternal operation of God, that influx that comes. Okay, But once they commit a deliberate venial sin, they're losing that one eternal operation within them. They're not leaving the grace of God. So let's make a distinction between two things here. The grace of God and the one eternal operation of God. God's one eternal operation does not tolerate deliberate sinfulness, even on a venial scale. Grace does. Grace tolerates that. So you can receive communion after having committed deliberate venial sins. And that's why before you do so, the church has the penitential act, which is supposed to remove those venial sins so that you receive Christ worthily without not having confessed them. Okay. But 
when you're receiving the divine will on loan, you're participating in all that, all those graces that God wishes to endow you with, but God doesn't give them all at once. He gives them progressively. So let's suppose you live your whole life on loan. You never actually live in the divine will permanently. Let's suppose you spend 60 years always getting better and better at it, but you're always going in and out. Does that mean you only receive those graces the first time you received it on loan? Of course not. God continues to shower more and more graces as you grow in degrees, whether it's on loan or whether it's permanently in his will. So yes, if you advance far enough on loan, you can participate in the divine virtues. But what do the divine virtues do? They enable every thought, word, and action of yours to impact all things of all time in one broad sweep. You can do that on loan. But you have to give your will to God firmly, and you have to do it with an upright intention. Without these two, you're not even going to receive it on loan. So it's not like on loan is one little step right here. No, on loan is can go on and on in degrees for, for years. Or it can be a short period depending upon your disposition and adherence to God's divine will. Whereby if he sees you properly disposed, he will give it permanently to you. Um, so, yeah, if you're um, living in the divine will alone, you can participate in the divine virtues. And if you commit one deliberate sin, you don't leave the grace of God. But that one eternal operation is not acting in you because God would be cooperating with that sin and he can't do that. Thank you. Father, a question from the chat. If someone receives the Eucharist with mortal sin on their soul, does Jesus not even enter, leave right away, or does he suffer until the accidents are dissolved? The last, the third. He suffers till the accidents are gone. He enters that polluted soul, the mire, and he suffers during that 10, 15 minutes until the body consumes him. Deborah, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my uh, question. Uh, can we say the gift of living in divine will puts a mark on your soul at baptism? That's a good question. And the, the theological word that the church uses for this, for baptism, is indelible. When you are baptized, no one not even God can unbaptize you. Now, God can do anything, but he has ordained from eternity never to take away his gifts. And this is a teaching in scripture in St. Paul's letter. It's also a teaching of the ecumenical councils. Once God gives a gift, he never takes it away. He can remove his favor. That's not a gift. It's just his disposition toward you, but his gifts remain. Like the gift he gave to Judas Iscariot of the episcopacy and the priesthood. He never took it back. Um, uh, so does the gift of living in the divine will impress, like baptism, an indelible character upon the soul that can never be erased? This is theologically what is found in Louisa's writings. The acts that we perform in God's divine will, whether it's on loan or, in, or permanently, whether it's given on loan or permanently, are indelible. Jesus tells us to Louisa about Adam. He tells her that even though Adam's first steps were accomplished in Eden, and he didn't go beyond the first steps, meaning he wasn't there very long before he sinned. He said even though he accomplished his first steps and then sinned, his acts remain for all eternity in me. And what is these acts are inseparable from me. Now, the question is, and it's not addressed in Louise's works, can a soul who has performed these divine acts be lost if they are in, inseparable from God? In other words, can a soul separate itself from these indelible acts? There's no clear-cut answer in Louise's text here. Now, if I give an answer, it's only my theological opinion, which I don't often do. I never give opinions because 
I don't want to get my myself in the way of what God is teaching, the pure word of Christ and Louisa. And that's why I refrain from jumping to personal conclusions on things like this. But I believe, and again, if I say no, I don't want you to get the wrong impression that, oh, I didn't act in the divine will. That means I can live the way I want and I'm going to be saved. We have to understand what it means to do a divine act in the divine will. You have to have a proper understanding of what that means. A divine act in the divine will. There's different types of acts in the divine will. You have the imperfect act, you have the perfect act, and you have the complete act. My theological opinion is when you do that complete act, even one, you receive what Jesus tells Louise is this, the mark of sure predestination. That's the word he uses in Louise's text. Il sigillo della sicura predestinazione. And I believe that, that that kind of act, yes, is connected to the soul and God indelibly. Thank you. Hello, oh, Father, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you had um, a question, I think either last week or the week before. When Jesus was going around in his trials uh, on that night, he didn't, and he, he, he said that he didn't answer any one of them except one, uh, except for Pontius Pilate, but of course. But he didn't there was another. Herod, is what I said. He Herod. Answered Herod. Right. He answered Herod. That's what you said, right? He did not answer Herod. Oh, he did not. But he answered instead the high priest. What I said the other night, I didn't mention Pilate. I said he'd never said a word to Herod in response. But he, when the high priest, Caiaphas, put him under obedience, he said, I adjure you in the name of the living God. Are you the son of God? He had to answer. He had to obey the powers of the priesthood. And he said, I am. So then by his, um, in obedience to the powers of priesthood in the Jewish, in the Jewish setting, is that the basis for people saying that in the church, even though you may not agree with the church or you have a thing, if the church says to do X in obedience, you must follow. No, yes. no, again. So the question is, most people blindly obey what the church says in all things. The answer is no. Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. I'll give you the distinction that the First Vatican Council teaches. There, the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, is essential for all ecclesiastical authority. Once the bishops or the priests lose union, separate themselves from the vicar, they have no ecclesial authority, none. So that means that the Pope is really the linchpin that connects us to Christ, the vicar. And it's founded in Matthew's gospel. Okay. Now, Jesus alludes to this also when he spoke of the seat of Moses in Matthew chapter 23, saying the scribes and the Pharisees occupy the seat of Moses, so obey them in everything they tell you but do not follow their example because they do not practice what they preach. But nonetheless, he had them obey like he had Louise obey the confessor in all things in volume one and for the rest of her life. Now, the church as the Vatican, first Vatican council teaches through this union with the Pope exercises authority in four fields only, only four. These are identified by the first Vatican council, by the second Vatican council, by, yeah. Okay, so what are these four? fields of competency over the which the church exercises authority. Number one, faith. Number two, morals. Number three, church governance. And number four, church discipline. That's it. So if the church teaches something about the weather or about sports or about global warming or about immigration or about politics, it's not covered under these. These are opinions, personal opinions. Does that mean you're disobeying? No, just because you don't agree with an opinion of this or that prelate doesn't mean you're disobeying the church. You're disobeying when you fail to follow these four that the church teaches. Faith, morals, church discipline, church governance. If you want to find out where this is, I put out a work, it's on the website, a free download entitled, Can the Pope Become a Heretic? And I did a study of all the popes throughout the last 2000 years and not one pope was a heretic, not one. So you see, what makes the thing heretical is once the church sanctions that teaching as divine and ecclesial. And we have to adhere to that. There are four types of adherence of faith. There's divine faith, 
This is for another day. If you want to go into how we are to adhere to church teaching, prophetic revelation when it's approved, when it's not approved, to have divine faith, ecclesial faith, theological faith, and Catholic faith. Okay, and many people don't even know about these distinctions, but several theologians teach how to adhere to certain teachings of the church or things approved by the church, namely Fatima messages, and how they are to do so. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. So we'll wrap things up here. I'll ask you to all unmute and say good night to me and good day to you, wherever you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Tomorrow night afternoon here, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, God bless you. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. That's it, Father. Bye, Father. God bless you. Keep you all in God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. I'm great, I'm great. 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 I'm great.